to say a couple more things here uh, about the Saros cycle and transits. Transits are similar to eclipses, a similar concept that is. Uh, Saros cycle, let me explain that. Uh, we know that eclipse seasons occur at about five uh, and two thirds month intervals. So that means an eclipse doesn't always occur at exactly the same time every year. So two uh, eclipse cycle uh, seasons, you know, is going to be uh, just over 11 months. And so uh, the other thing that happens is the moon's elliptical orbit means sometimes it's closer, sometimes it's farther away. That changes, you know, uh, the nature of the eclipse. Uh, also, the tilt of the moon's orbit precesses and changes directions a little bit. And so when that happens, it also changes what the eclipses look like. And this is where an interesting thing happens. The synodic month, that's the cycle of the phases, the draconic month and anomalistic month, the draconic month is, is from node to node. That's, that's the, the cycle of eclipse seasons. And anomalistic months, that's going to be the perihelion, aphelion sort of thing. So uh, 223 synodic months and 242 draconic months and 239 anomalistic months all add, are all almost the same to within two hours. So that means you go 223 cycles of the moon's phases. And in the meantime, there have been exactly 242 cycles of, uh, of the eclipse seasons or, 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 or draconic months. And then, uh, so that means you're back into the same eclipse season because it's, it's an even number there. And then uh, 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 it's 239 anomalistic months, which means the moon's about the same distance that it used to be. And so that means that you will get an eclipse that is almost identical to what you had seen before. And so a Saros is this cycle that repeats. So a Saros, which, are, which is, which is uh, all of this up here, that Saros is 18 years, 11 days, and 8 hours. So every 18 years, you get the same kind of eclipse. Well, it's, it's also 11 days and eight hours. So eight hours is about a third of a day. And so that means that it's a third of the way around the Earth. So you'd actually have to wait three Saro cycles or 54 years and one month. And 54 years and one month is going to be at the same location on Earth, almost the same Eclipse. So certainly, if you're in that particular location on Earth, you'd see the same lunar eclipse. Uh, and almost the same location on Earth would see the same solar eclipse. So, for example, there was a solar eclipse, a very deep, cool, uh, you know, uh, one of the longest possible solar eclipses. It occurred in 1955. Well, it also occurred um, 18 years uh, uh, later, uh, 18 years and 10 days later, and, and or 18 ye years and, and a number, uh, yeah, eight, about 10 days later in June of 1973, and then in July of 1991, right across Mexico, and then it's going to happen again. It happened again uh, July of of 2009, and then it's going to happen again in August of 2027, uh, and then finally in August 12th of 2045, one of the longest possible eclipses will run right across North America, right near the edge of Texas, and so uh, that is going to be a really spectacular thing. Uh, it also, though, means that the Saros cycles repeat here, again, every 54 years, everything's lined up just right again. So that means that, you, that if you get a really spectacular lunar eclipse, you get another really spectacular lunar eclipse 54 years later. Now, interesting thing, uh, at Stonehenge, there's, uh, uh, they discovered that some of the alignments here, that, that if you're standing in here looking out between the arches, things are lined up just right so that uh, if the moon is rising in a particular spot, you would see a lunar eclipse. And you'd see the same lunar eclipse 54 years later. Interestingly enough, there's like 54 little holes uh, marked around here. 
Okay, and so what does that mean? Well, we don't know because the people that built this thing did not write down what they were doing or why, and then they all died out by the time people showed up that did write stuff down. And so we really have no idea what Stonium was really used for, but it's very suggestive this is like a giant astronomical calendar. Again, the sun would shine, would rise, lined up in a particular way at the solstices or, or equinoxes, and, and uh, again, it would, it would line up with lunar things. And again, the idea would be in the ancient world, they didn't really understand exactly what was happening, but they did know that every now and then the moon would turn this blood red color, and that's really frightening. And so you can imagine if the moon is one of your, your chief deities, and it looks like it's been wounded and bleeding, then you're going to want to, like, you know, make it happy or sacrifice something to it or worship it or do something, whatever you do. And, and so uh, that's possibly what this thing was designed for is so that they would know that, hey, when they see the moon rising in a particular spot on every 54 years, I don't know, they might have moved a pot plant from hole to hole every year. Uh, so they knew that when it's in one spot, uh, uh, it was uh, going to be a lunar eclipse, and they would prepare for that. Um, there are other indications that a lot of the people in the ancient world did something similar, uh, keeping track of eclipses. Okay. Saros, again, very important, keeping track every 54 years, the moon's orbit repeats. Other astronomical alignments that happen, okay, uh, there's occultations. So uh, what would happen with an occultation is that you have, uh, for example, a planet and the moon comes along and covers it. So it eclipses the planet. Okay, or sometimes one planet can occult another planet or a planet can occult a star. So it would move right in front of it. Uh, so, for example, uh, here is uh, some photographs taken a number of years ago, and we've got the moon there, and we've got Saturn up there. And so then what happens is that a uh, um, few minutes later, the moon has moved, and it's starting to cover Saturn. And it disappears. I had another interesting lab, uh, extra credit lab that, that I did uh, about 10 years ago in which uh, the moon rose while it was in front of Jupiter. And so I scheduled an optional lab at like four in the morning. And so, uh, believe it or not, I had students show up. And so uh, we set up telescopes and we're watching and the students get all excited because suddenly one of Jupiter's moons appeared around the edge of Saturn. And as we're watching, Jupiter slowly appeared from behind, or rather, rather Jupiter slowly appeared from behind the moon. And so that was really cool. Uh, did something similar to that uh, a few decades ago uh, when I was first starting to teach astronomy with Venus. The moon rose with Venus in uh, behind it, and then all of a sudden Venus popped out from behind the moon, and the students were just so excited to see something dynamic like that. A conjunction. That would be if you've got two things moving past each other in the sky. So a few days ago, uh, 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 like last week or so, we had Jupiter and Saturn in the sky and the moon passed by. The moon moves about its own width in an hour. So uh, one night it was passing by one of these and the next night passing by the other one. Uh, now, actually, the actual closest approach happened uh, during the daytime for us, not rather at night, but so Europe got to see the actual conjunction. But we got to see the moon on one side of the planet uh, uh, one night, and the next night it was on the other side. Okay. Uh, sometimes several planets pass by near each other. In 2006, there was like a triple conjunction of Jupiter and Mercury and Mars all moving around the sky and passing close to each other. And a pulse is going to be like a conjunction, except the two objects are so close together that to the naked eye, they look like one thing, and you need a telescope to actually see you've got two of them there. A pulses are very, very rare. And then finally, a transit. A transit occurs when something passes in front of something else, but it's too small to completely cover it. So it's kind of like the annular eclipse. 
uh, famous for transit here was uh, back about 15 years ago. This is a photograph that I took of the sun and that little arrow pointing right there to a dot. That dot right there is the planet Mercury, which is directly in front of the sun as seen from Texas. Uh, and then a few years ago, we had a transit of Venus in which Venus passed directly in front of the sun. And so we had telescopes set up to watch that as well. Uh, the last transit of Mercury was in November of last year. And we did, in fact, uh, have telescopes set up to observe the transit of Mercury. And so we had, had telescopes set up and students that were interested could come and watch this little dot move across the face of Mercury. Okay, so transit of Mercury, uh, this is where you had to be. So we did not actually see the entire transit. So what happened was the transit was already in progress when Mercury, when, when the sun rose and we saw it come out. But uh, if you were in South America, you could have seen the entire transit. So did you miss the transit in November of 2019? Okay. I saw it, uh, but then I knew it was happening. If you missed it, the next one is going to be November of 2032. So you've got a ways to wait. Uh, so it's going to be a ways to go until the next one. So 12 more years from now until the next one. And oh, wait. It starts at 06 UT. This is standard time, so six hours. So that's going to be at 041, so 1241 AM. Well, if it's passing in front of the sun, guess what you see? Nothing. It ends at 1107 UT. Subtract six hours, that's 507 AM. Sun's not up yet. So that means that this next transit of Mercury, when it happens, is going to be visible in Europe and Asia and Africa, but not in North and South America. The next one visible in Texas, you have to wait until May of 2049. Okay. And that one is going to happen. And again, it's actually going to start at about, uh, uh, this is May, so that's going to be daylight saving time. Uh, so subtract five hours from this. So it's going to start 6.03 a.m. So it's going to start right about the time that the sun's rising. Then Mercury will start to go in there, but it's going to end about 11 44 a.m. So just before noon. So that morning. So that's going to be nice because May can sometimes be hot. Okay. So 2049 May transit of Mercury.